Hey up, it's Steve from the Old Yorkshire Geek and welcome to this countdown of my top 10 favourite Babylon 5 episodes. And it was pretty hard getting a top 10, I must admit. I did, I've had to whittle it down. Uh, but the, my favourite 10 episodes of Babylon 5. And at the end, I'm going to have like an honourable mention. It's not an episode, it's one of the movies, which I really love. So I'm going to mention that when we get going. Um, um, I'll do it at the end. I'll do it at the end. Uh, right, so, anyway, uh, so, as um, as I usually say in these things, this is, it's my top ten favourite episodes, not necessarily the best episodes. Um, to be honest, on thinking about it, they're kind of the most action-packed episodes with space battles and stuff that have turned out to be my top tens, but whatever, whatever, so we'll get on with it. We'll, we will just get on with it, and I will um, um, start the countdown. Right, so first up, first up in the the top ten is um, uh, from season four, uh, episode twenty two. By the way, there's no season five episodes in my top ten. I wonder if everybody thinks that. I don't know. In me, initially I had about a top fourteen or fifteen, and I whittled it down. I did have one episode from season five, uh, which was view from the gallery, which I do like that episode, but. Um, in my top ten, it's ended up there's been no 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 episodes from season five. So I was tempted to put the last episodes from season five. I think it's the last one. Um but technically that that was um a season four episode because that was filmed at the end of for the end of season four and then they kept it when they found out they were gonna get another season, they saved it. But anyway, anyway, by the way, so anyway. So season four, episode twenty two, the deconstruction of falling stars, which is kind of the last episode of Babylon Five. You could count it as that. But um anyway, so here it is. Um there we are, we begin. Uh, and it's all done in kind of flashbacks or whatever. Uh the the episode is, is essentially set in the future, a million years in the future, and some bloke is uh, watching you know, old tapes, uh, recordings of what happened in Babylon 5 um, after uh, the formation of the Interstellar Alliance. So, so that's what happens in the episode. There we go, we've seen... Uh, um, oh, and it's very 90s, by the way. Babylon, I love Babylon 5, but... Um, hang on, where are we? Um, oh, it's not bloody showing them, is it? I can tell you. Never mind. There we go. Uh, it is very 90s, and it, it, it has dated quite badly, I think, in uh, in the displays and stuff like that. Uh, it is of its time. And some people argue that Star Trek's the same, but I don't think it is. The original series was of its time, it was very 60s, and the early part, maybe the first couple of seasons of uh, Next Generation, were, were very 80s. I think after that, Star Trek has, has became kind of timeless-ish. Um, from season three onwards in Deep Space Nine and Voyager. I think they were anyway. But anyway, that's by the by. So it's done in, in flashback. There's somebody watching from the future, uh, watching old news recordings and stuff like that. And uh, at first, this, it's, it's set a year after the formation of the Interstellar Alliance when Earth is freed from uh, President Clark's tyranny. Um, the, the Great War Against the Shadows had been you know, fought and won. And all that, um, and so basically, um, you know, it's a review of what's what's gone on, and um, uh, and it's all done done pretty well. That's it. At first, it's it's a year after, so it's all, you know, talking heads and stuff like that, and um, and then as it goes, and then we go to a thousand, um, a hundred years afterwards, and then um, we see an old Delenn in a bit. She comes out because uh, these talking heads. Basically, um, say nasty things about um, John Sheridan and stuff. And then an old Delaney, she goes, comes out and, and sticks up for him, saying he's a great man. And then we go to a thousand years, um, or was it 500? I can't remember. Um, in the future, and it uh, Earth's become like a totalitarian state again. And um, these holograms, they have holograms of the Babylon 5 main cast. Uh, basically outwit them <laughs> and uh, make them blow themselves up. Uh, and then we go to like a thousand years in the future um, where technology has, uh, Earth has reverted and um, uh, Earth has become like the medieval times and um, we've seen it through through the view of these monks 
uh, but they're not really monks. It turns out they're rangers, um, so they know what's really going on. That's why we've got the... Oh, you can't see it's behind me, never mind. Uh, for each cam review, obviously they're all recordings, for each cam review uh, it's got little Roman numerals for, for the different cameras. Uh, and so they've got the Earth has got to find a way to uh, get back into space again. Uh, and then it ends uh, where we see, there we go, that's the fella that's been uh, watching these recordings with a terrible, bloody, <laughs> um, what they call it, um, scalp, what they call them, school cap thing, to cover his hair up, it looks bloody awful. But anyway, and it turns out in a million years, humans essentially become Vorlons because he uh, gets into his, because the sun's going to go Nova and he gets into his, in his, in, into his encounter suit oh, in a minute. Here we go. He turns into light. There we go. And gets into his encounter, his Vorlon style encounter suit. Look, that's what humans are going to become in the uh, in a million years. We're going to become the Vorlons. We're going to be like the first ones, etc. So there we go. And it's a cool episode. I like it. Like I said, it's made me top ten. And it is like the final ever episode of Babylon Five, even though it was the last episode of season four. Uh, the, the thought it were going to get cancelled, which is why they wrapped up the the Shadow War in season four a bit too early, if I, if, if you have my opinion. But um, that's why season five. But a bit, I'm not a fan of season five of Babylon Five. To be completely honest, it's got some good episodes in, but I'm not a big fan of it. To be completely honest, who, who cares about the uh, telepath war? I don't give a monkeys about it. But anyway, so there we go. So that's number 10 in my list, the deconstruction of falling stars. Uh, so number 9 in my top 10 um, episodes of Babylon 5 is uh, from season 2. It's episode 16, In the Shadow of Zahadoom. Um, J. Max Straczynski did homage <laughs> a lot of things from science fiction and fantasy. Forbidden Planet, Shakespeare... Um, Lord of the Rings, Zahadoom, it's just Kazadoom, it's just, you know, shadows, the shadows from Kazadoom, you know, whatever. But anyway, we've all done it, I suppose. Uh, and this is the one where Sheridan learns that his wife might still be alive, or there's a chance that maybe she's still alive, because he finds out that Mr. Morden, the bad guy, uh, who's working for the shadows, who got Londo into, you know, doing all the stuff that happened with the Centauri, um, Turned out he was he's a, he were on the ship that blew up that his wife were on, so if if he's survived, maybe she's still alive. So what, and he's on the station, so he essentially arrests um, Mister Maud and just keeps him for questioning. But also at the same time, Night Watch appears. Uh, Earth is turning into a totalitarian state. Loads of bureaucracy. Um, uh, like 1984 style government, you know, lies are truth and stuff like that. Uh, and that's Susan, uh, who's not impressed uh, with this fella that's uh, trying to um, engage her in uh, the night watch. Uh, there he is. Um, oh, he's talking there to uh, Talia Winters, uh, who's a character I didn't really like, but I did like her when she changed. Uh, they just got rid of her character. But uh, I don't know why, they just did. But anyway, there it is, is keeping modern. Um, so there it is, there it is. As I said, uh, it's arrested Mr. Morden because um, uh, if, if if he survived the destruction um, of the ship that his wife were on, uh, which name escapes me for the minute, I, I can't remember. But anyway, um, maybe his wife is is uh, is there. And then, but he keeps getting warned off. And also there's the Night Watch, um, the Night Watch, there's a you know, new department from Earth, so it's all very totalitarian, spying on your neighbours, getting your neighbours into trouble, anybody speaks out against the government, they get arrested, all that sort of thing. Um, the other people on the station, the ambassadors and all that, find out that Mr Morden is being held by Captain Sheridan. They say, you've got to let him go. He's, um, he's, you know, he's employed by the Centauri, so they're, they're extended diplomatic immunity. And Delenn and... Um, and Kosh come and say that you've got to, you've got to free him uh, because you know he's dangerous. He's connected with the shadows, and this is where the, the show. This is where there's the lovely delay. The late Mira Ferlin, who I've met at a convention, she was lovely. Um, 
They tell John Sheridan, they show him all about what happened uh, with the Icarus. That was the name of the ship, the Icarus, um, when it got to Zahadoom. Uh, so they were showing that. And they get his first proper glimpse of the um, of the shadows. Um, so he lets him go, uh, but not before. There we go. We see the shadows. He's never alone. He's Mr. Morden. He's always got shadows near him. For some reason, they can be invisible. Don't know why, but they just can be. But uh, there we go. And it's a cool episode. It's a cool, you know, the, the setting piece, a chessboard, putting pieces in place uh, and all that. So that's a, a cool episode. It's number nine uh, in the shadow of Zahadoom. Right, next up uh, is uh, number eight in my uh, list of my top ten favourite episodes of Babylon 5 is War Without End. This is a two-parter that I'm counting as one episode, obviously. Um War Without End, uh, which is kind of a follow-on from Babylon Squared, which, spoilers, is a little bit... Well, I think it's the next one uh, in the list. Um, and this is one that... Uh, it's all about Babylon 4 and um, the Shadow War, which happened a thousand years ago, and now it's happening again. And Babylon 4, we learn, was uh, taken back um, in time um, to act as a base... For the 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 Minbari and the other races that were fighting against the shadows, uh, because the Minbari um, base that they had were destroyed by the shadows, so they needed a new base. For some reason, a clunky old Earth station was just the thing they needed. But anyway, uh, and we well, uh, Jeff Sinclair comes back. Uh, he's been working on Minbar, and um, so off he goes. Um, Oh, right, and he's, this is uh, the Minbari that's been working with him, um, played by Time Winters. I don't know if he's famous, but he got uh, and Time Winters as Rathen, but uh, he's there, been there working with him. And another another Vol on here, probably called Kosh. They all seem to be called Kosh, don't they? But anyway, and he says, um, uh, we learn that he's returning to the beginning, because they all speak like that. Anyway, so, uh, essentially, they've got to go... And um, they get, they're getting a message, um, a secret, not a secret message, a, um, a distress call. And it, but it's from Babylon 5 and it's been destroyed. Uh, you hear Susan Ivanova's voice, but it's coming from Sector 14 or whatever the hell it's called, where Babylon 4 disappeared four years earlier. Um, so they've got to go out. Then Delen comes and says, we've got to go and do this thing. And then apparently there's a beam. There we go. That's the, the a time rift. There's a beam coming from Epsilon 3, which is the moon that Babylon 5 orbits, or the planet that Babylon 5 orbits. Um, and it's opening up a time rift. And that's where the signal's coming from. So they've got to go there and basically... Um, they've got to reenact what they did in Babylon Squared, which we're going to learn in a bit. Um and uh, go all that. We meet Zathras, who works, who's from Epsilon 3. He works for the Great Machine. The Great Machine is basically the, the machine from Forbidden Planet. <laughs> it is. As I said, he uh, homages a lot of stuff. So the, it's a time travel one. They've got to go back in time and all that stuff. And... Uh, and um, and and basically get the get the station ready to travel back a thousand years in the past, act as this base. So, right. Uh, but anyway, when they go there uh, and start doing their shenanigans in the past um, on Babylon Four, um, why does Babylon Four look so different to Babylon Five? By the way, you'd think they use the same design again, wouldn't you? But they don't. It looks totally different. But anyway, whatever. Why is Babylon Four? So far away from the jump gate, was it originally? Because they never mentioned it. That it you know, because usually the the stick, the station is next to the jump gate. Um, why is Babylon Four? It's a three-hour trip in normal space. Why is it so far from a jump gate? They never explain that either. But anyway, never mind. Uh, what happens? They go and start doing, um, you know, getting Babylon Four ready to travel back in time, and uh, but. They've got these devices on that Zathras give them to keep them locked in, in the proper time so they don't drift off and stuff. But Sheridan's gets um, gets broken and we see that uh, he goes forward in time uh, to see the, the fall of Centauri Prime and Londo as Emperor. There he is. Um, but uh, anyway, so, but uh, lots of... Uh, there's Babylon 4, look, there it is. Um 
Here it is, Babylon 4. Why does it look so different? I don't know. And apparently we're the largest of the Babylon stations. I mean, Babylon 5 is five miles long, so how big is bloody Babylon 4? I don't know, but anyway. Uh, where were we? Where were we? Um, so, yeah, they're, they're going... Uh, uh, they deal with that. And obviously it all works and everything's all lovely. But um, um, Jeffrey Sinclair, we see who's, something's happened to him because of the time travel. He's gone all old. Uh, he elects to go back. We learn that he's got to go back. He's got to go with the station back a thousand years. And Zathras goes with him as well. Um, and then we learn at the end what happened. Um, in a minute. <laughs> uh, here he goes. Uh, the station arrives. Gets some bin bari from a thousand years ago. And they go. Zathras takes them. And there we le- we see. There he is. There's Jeffrey Sinclair. Who's become a, a min bari. He has become Valen, uh, we're like, like basically Minbari Jesus. He's become Valen, a Minbari, not born of Minbar. Because obviously Jeffrey Sinclair's from Earth. And there we go. He's got a couple of Orlons flanking him for a bit of gravitas. <laughs> uh, so there we go. So like I say, he has returned to the beginning. That's what the Orlons said. So there we go. So there we go. So it's a cool episode. It is a cool episode. It's a two-parter, uh, and it's super exciting, and there's fighting the shadows in and everything, and the time travel and all that stuff. It is cool. So there we go. So that will be number eight, uh, War Without End, parts one and two from season three, episode 16 and 17. So number seven in my countdown and my top ten favourite Babylon 5 episodes is uh, Babylon Squared from season one, all the way back in season one, uh, episode 20 of season one, uh, where Babylon 4 re-emerges, uh, as we've just seen in the number eight, uh, War Without End. Babylon 4 reappears from the past. It just vanished. I think the first three Babylon stations exploded or were sabotaged. You know, they were either accidents or they were sabotaged. Um, and then the fourth one just vanished into thin air, and we learned what happened with that. It went back in time, and the fifth one, that one stuck. Anyway, so here we go. There it is, appearing for a, in front of a Star Fury pilot. Um, and so they decide to go, and uh, oh, there's a cool uh, thing of uh, Star Fury, uh, a cool sh- a cool fighter ship from Earth Alliance, the Star Fury. Uh, I like Earth Alliance ships in Babylon 5 because they're all clunky with thrusters and all stuff like that. Other races have more sleek, advanced ships, like the Minbari. Um, but Earth Alliance ships are all clunky and the big cruisers they've got have got spinning parts for gravity. We don't even have artificial gravity. But anyway. Anyway, so they decide they've got to go. I remember, this is Jeffrey Sinclair in command of Babylon 5, um, who's, uh, who's just a commander. Not even a captain. Had to wait for season two before they got a captain. So they're going to go and rescue the crew from Babylon 4. There's about a thousand people on, so they've got to take shuttles and stuff like that and ferry them off. Uh, meanwhile, Delenz, she's sum- summoned back to the Grey Council because she used to be part of the Grey Council before she became ambassador to Delenz. And um, uh, she's got to basically choose... What she's uh, what she's going to do? She chooses to remain. She, they want her to become leader of the Grey Council. You see, um, but she says no. She don't want to. She's she's got a, the calling of her heart is to stay on Babylon Five, and 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 see what happens. Um, so she gets essentially ejected from the Grey Council, but she goes back later. Don't worry. Anyway, so here they are. They've arrived on Babylon Four. That's this is the commander. Um, yeah. It's where they meet Zathras, because obviously he's there from War Without End, um, and we see the others um, popping up every now and again. Uh, and it's a cool episode uh, that we see again <laughs> in War Without End, but it's, I think I prefer this episode over War Without End. I don't know why, I just do. Uh, but um, as I said, Delenn makes her choice, because Babylon 5 is all about choices you make, for good or bad. Anyway, so the the... They manage to, uh, to get away, and uh, Babylon 4 disappears. They don't know where to. So, and it's uh, it is a cool episode. It's setting things up for later, uh, not only for Babylon 4 uh, and our heroes, but also for Dylan and what's going to happen with the Minbari people and all that stuff. It is cool. So that's number seven, uh, Babylon Squared from season one, episode twenty. Right. So, so next up, number six in my list. Um, on my top 10 favourite Babylon 5 episodes. I'm going to say that every time, it'll annoy you. Um, 
is from season three. It's episode twenty-two. It's the last. You know, it's the climax of uh, episode of season three. It's Zaha Doom, uh, where Captain Sheridan has to make a choice. Remember, it's all about choices in Babylon Five. Um, what do you want and all that stuff? Um, and it's where we meet Sheridan's wife. There she is, uh, Melissa Gilbert as Anna Sheridan. Uh, she's had a head transplant. We'd seen Sheridan's wife before. Uh, Anna, she's called Anna Sheridan. Uh, in an earlier episode in season two, where we learned that you know she was killed and all that stuff, and they had like images of her, and there were even a video, and it were a, a different actress. But for some reason, for this one, they've got a new actress in uh, who just happens to be Bruce Bo- Box Lightner's real life wife. Uh, you may know her from Little House on the Prairie. Uh, she was a child actor in that. But anyway, she just appears. Uh, that her and um, this is Sheridan's quarters. She's gone into, and uh, Delenn's there because uh, Sheridan and Delenn have become an item. Uh, and as she's walked, she's saying, "I'm Anna Sheridan, Jeff, um, John's wife." So, so that's all. Uh, so he's all uh, not for six by this. Anyway, she she wants to take him to Zahadoom. Um, she's been sent by the shadows, and she said, "They're not what you think." <laughs> so, um, so he's going to do that. Um, going to take one of the white stars, and um, and all that jazz. So off he goes. I think stuff's going on with the Centauri as well. What happens with that? I can't remember. We will have to see. Um, he was asking uh, Gary Baldy, my least favourite character. I've never been a fan of Mr. Gary Baldy. I'm sorry, but uh, another late actor. Lots of the actors from Babylon 5 have passed away. But um, anyway. Uh, so he takes the uh, White Star. Um, the favour he was asking of Mr. Gary Baldy what to do with the White Star. Basically, put some nuclear bombs on board because the Jakar, the Nan ambassador, um, had. had had got the um, Babylon 5 some nuclear weapons that we're going to use as mines uh, around the station. Um, so he's, he's, he's stolen a couple for the to take on the White Star because he doesn't trust them. Uh, it's a little clip showing what happened at uh, Zahadoom with Icarus. Uh, but anyway, so here he is, he's arrived. Um, and while all this is going on, loads of shadow ships appear at Babylon 5. Um, and if if he if he doesn't agree to join the shadows, they're going to destroy Babylon Five. Essentially, that's what's going to happen. Uh, so he's, he's he's trying to explain to him what the what the the thing is, what the crack is. Here we go. Shadow ships arriving at Babylon Five. Look. Oh dear. There's Mister Morden. Uh, probably saying something bad to somebody. Um, oh, he's he's, he's on uh, Zahadoom with him, isn't he? Uh, and it's a cool episode. It's a cool episode. Obviously, John Sheridan's having none of it. Um, so he, he pulls a gun out, starts shooting, uh, does a little thing on his on his wrist thing, on his whatever they call it, and uh, calls down the White Star, um, which comes barreling down. Oh, he's left a message for Delenn saying, I love you, Delenn. Because she thought, because Anna were back on the scene, they were over. Uh, and he had he had shouted at her a bit earlier on, saying, "How can I trust you?" Because she knew there were a possibility that she knew that Anna was still alive. But anyway, now he's saying, "I love you," because he thinks he's going to die, uh, and he does. Spoilers, he does die. But anyway, um, here he is. He's got his back to the wall. Uh, the white stars coming down. Maybe she's saying, "Come with us, come with us," and he jumps because he is cosh in his mind. Kosh says, J- the wall on, Kosh says jump, so he jumps, there we go, uh, and he does jump to his death, uh, she's looking down, here comes the White Star, with its nuclear bombs on board, but you think its engines would be enough, wouldn't you, to, uh, anyway, and it basically blows up the, the shadow base that's there on Zahadoom, obviously that doesn't destroy all the shadows, but it's a, a setback, there it goes, um, and because of that, all the shadows that are surrounding Babylon 5 all go, probably go back to Zahad, see what's going on. And um, But they take Mr. Gary Baldy. Before they go, there we go, they, they take him. A shadow passes over him, and Mr. Gary Baldy is taken. And season four, stuff happens with Mr. Gary Baldy. 
Um, so they think he's dead. They think Sheridan's dead, and technically he is. But uh, don't worry, he doesn't stay dead for long. Uh, it's a cool episode. Is uh, Zahadoom um, a good a good season ender uh, where you don't know what's going to happen? So there we go. Um, so they've all got to work out what to do. Yeah, cool, cool episode. Um, so right, moving on, moving on. So, I forgot what number we're up to. Uh, number five. <laughs> I lost count there for a minute. Number five, my top ten Babylon 5 episode of all time. Uh, it's from season four, episode six, Into the Fire, uh, which is essentially the culmination of the Shadow War. I think they ended up a bit too early in the season, but um, I think they should have kept it going. Uh, it was supposed to be a five-season thing, wasn't it? But they thought they were going to get cancelled, so they wrapped it up. Pretty quickly, but it was still a cool episode. Um, so here we go. Um, there, there it is. There's uh, the White Star, which are bloody not very handsome ships, are they? But uh, anyway, never mind. Um, what they're doing, they're, they're, they're wanting to... Uh, by the way, what had happened here, the Vorlons, who were our friends, have decided that um, any world that's been touched by the shadows is going to get destroyed. Uh, so they're going around just wiping out planets. Um, they've got, essentially, the Vorlons have gone, gone potty, haven't they? So they've become the enemy as well. Uh, so all the other races, all the other younger races like Earth, Mimbari, uh, Centaur, well, not really Centaur because they're in with the shadows, are they? Um, Nans, Drac, Pacmara, all them, they've all joined together. Uh, they've got a big fleet. Uh, uh, there it is. There's the big fleet in hyperspace. Um, Sorry about the uh, quality. Um, I know there's a remastered Babylon Five out there, but I haven't, I haven't got that. But um, I bet it's just I bet it's just a bit crisp. They need to they need to redo it and redo all the visual effects, don't they? Make all the uh, CGI look cool. Anyway, they're going for a showdown. That's what they're doing. They're going for a showdown. Ivanova and and um, and Lorian. Lorian is an alien. That's the first one. Apparently, the first intelligent life in the galaxy, uh, and he's the one that brought Sheridan back to life after he was killed at Zahadu. Uh, anyway, he he's gone off with Ivanova in one of the White Stars to find some more of the first ones to bring to help him out. So we're going to see some of them in a bit. So there's going to be a big um, a big showdown um, against the Centaur. <laughs> Against the Vorlons and the Shadows. Um, so anyway, all right. Uh, meanwhile, on Centauri Prime, um, they had a mad emperor called Katagian who were basically going around killing people. And um, Londo got rid of him. Um, and now he's kind of been made the... He's not emperor, he's been made the prime minister. So he's in charge. Uh, and now that he's trying to get any thing to do with the Shadows off Centauri Prime. Because um, they know a Vorlon planet killer's coming, um, and there were some uh, shadow ships on this island uh, on Centauri Prime. So basically, it just blows up the island. Uh, but anyway, uh, so that's what's happening on Centauri Prime. There he is, uh, and he kills Morden, uh, chops Morden's head off, and puts it on the pike so that Veer can wave at him like that and smile, which he does. So anyway, so a big battle happens, a big space battle. Um, uh, but I'm probably not landing on any of it, am I? There we go. Big space battles happening. Uh, pew, 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 pew. They did they did do good space battles. Oh, this is one of the first ones arriving. Um, they did good did do good space battles in Babylon Five. But uh, I just wish they'd I know there's the remasters, I wish they'd just redo all the CG, bring it up to date. There's another first one ship. A bit weird, but anyway. Anyway, so this big battle's going on. Um in space, and um, essentially, it's what they do now. They've got to um, get the all the first ones and the Vorlons and the Shadows to basically go away. And that's what they do at the end. Um, uh, they have a, a, a meeting of the minds. They're, they're going to, you know, they have a, like an illus illusionary meeting. So this isn't really um, uh, linear. It's um, um, a shadow. Um, what they're doing? Delenn's talking to the shadows. Um, 
uh, Sheridan's talking to the Vorlons uh, in you know that's why it's all black. So it's like in their minds, um, and the shadows are appearing as people that you like, and the Vorlons is just a woman in a a gown. <laughs> Uh, if it shows, if I can find it, um, probably not. But anyway, the rejectum, the rejectum. Oh, there she is. Look, like, like bloody Guinevere, not Guinevere. Um, Mor Morgana Le Fay, or something like that in Excalibur, but in a plastic bag, not ice. Anyway, the rejectum. They say, get out of our galaxy. So they all go away, and um, Lorian goes with them, uh, and that's the end of them. So they're by themselves now. There's none of the first ones left. None of the ancient races. With technology beyond imagination. Um, there you go, that's one of the, the shadows leaving. There's Lorian. Uh, he's going as well. Um, so everything's lovely. They think, they think everything's fine, but they've still got to work, they've still got to um, sort out Earth, essentially. It, it moved from the shadow war to, to freeing Earth from the tyranny of President Clark. That's what it moves on from now on. Anyway, so there we go. So that's uh, my number five, uh, Into the Fire, uh, the end of the Shadow War. But we learned that it doesn't really end, sort of. Uh, there are still allies of the Shadows out there, like the um, um, Drac. Did I say Drac earlier on? I think I did, didn't I? Uh, with the ships, I said Drac and I meant Drazi. Uh, the Drac, uh, the um, allies of the Shadows that we meet. I think they're mentioned. Are they mentioned in that? I think they are in this. Or were it in Crusade? <laughs> I can't remember. They're also in Legend of the Rangers. But anyway, whatever. Um, but uh, Into the Fight's a good episode. Like I say, it's the uh, culminates the Shadow War, and then we move on to Freeing Earth. So that's cool. Right, so we're up to number four in my list of my top ten favourite Babylon 5 episodes. Uh, this is Endgame. This is the the culmination. It's not the final episode of season four. Uh, that was deconstruction of falling stars. Uh, it's the not the second last. It's the third last, I think. Um, yeah. Um, episode uh, season four, episode twenty, uh, Endgame, um, which sees um, the uh, Babylon Five fleet. Uh, I've got to mention we saw them in different uniforms. They're like black uniforms. Uh, Babylon Five people uh, because they the uh, seceded from earth so they got new uniforms they didn't wear earth force uniforms anymore uh, because of you know clark's tyranny and all that night watch and all this stuff that were happening but anyway so end game got a big fleet of um, earth alliance ships because obviously some earth alliance ships and officers had gone over to babylon 5 side and uh, so they've got a big fleet that they're going to go and free earth uh, but they've got some aliens as well, some Mimbari and Nan and all that. Um, but Sheridan says he wants them as a backup, uh, you know, because this is an Earth problem, and it, it you know, he'd rather not uh, have uh, you know um, alien forces, you know, battling Earth uh, if they can help it. But they're there as backup, and they do need them uh, in a bit. So off we go. There it is. Uh, there's Marcus. Uh, he appeared in. Uh, did he appear in season three? I think he did. Uh, he's a ranger. Um, good character. Everybody likes Marcus. He's madly in love with Susan Ivanova. Um, and that's, that's why he's looking sad, because she got hurt. She was, like, mortally wounded um, during a battle. And um, he's got to find a way to save her. And um, he does. He, he gives his life to save her. He dies at the end. He uses a machine that we've used, that were in a, a previous episode. Um that uh, draws life from one person and heals another and he uses that and basically kills himself to save her. Um, so anyway. So uh, they've got to go on free Earth. So these are on Mars. They've got stuff to do on Mars and um, and all that stuff. And so there's going to be a big battle in space, but they've got to uh, disable the Earth, Earth Alliance ships, uh, Earth Alliance uh, battleships. Uh, there's about 30 of them. Um, and they're putting on these humans that the that after the shadow war they found these humans that have been converted to work to operate shadow vessels, and uh, they can't do anything with them. They can't take the implants out on Babylon Five. Uh, you think they take it to Minbar or somewhere like that to do it? But no, they've got to 
They want to do it on Earth, but they can't because Earth is like a totalitarian state. So anyway, they're going to use 30 of them. I don't know how many they've got. I think they've got quite a lot. Uh, they've got 30 of them that are going to... What they do, they're kind of like the Borg. Um, um, just, if you wake them up, they just want to merge with the, the first ship that the, they encounter. So they wanna, they're going to put them on one of these Earth Alliance destroyers and... Um, and they'll they'll you know disrupt the ship, so it's a they use them as a diversion. So anyway, that's what they're going to do. Uh, and the the here we go here the they're arriving. Look, uh, oops, I meant to press pause. Then sorry. Um, anyway, so they get to Earth. Uh, we've got these are the Earth defense platforms. Um, they get to Earth. They bypass Mars because they shut down all the. The Earth Alliance ships that have amassed at Mars, uh, and they shed it in these forces, head to Earth, that do a, a jump to Earth. Uh, and these are all the, the Earth defense platforms. And President Clark, because he knows he knows he's in, he's, he's done for. Um, he activates what he calls his scorched Earth thing. So he, he turns all the platforms round to uh, onto Earth, and he's going to you know scour it. If he's if he's going, he's taking Earth with him, uh, and then he takes his own life. Uh, so they've got to destroy all these platforms. That's when he calls in all the alien fleet as well. He said, we need your help. We've got to destroy all these platforms. And it's all cool and exciting. There we go. It's all stuff blowing up. Um, and then it ends with the the last platform gets destroyed just in time by the other, the baddie Earth Force fleet. They arrive um, just in time because everybody's friends now. <laughs> now Clark's dead. And here comes the Agamemnon through the flames. Yeah. Cool stuff. And Earth is freed. Uh, and the ISN's back on the air. The newsreader's crying, it's been a long time since we were closed down. And all that stuff. So, there we go. Uh, and, this, and they also find out that um, Marcus had gone back to Babylon 5 to save Susan with that machine. And he does, and he says, I love you, there he is, and he dies, and she lives. And in the next episode, um, there's all the fallout from that, and the fallout from Sheridan, um, hang on, press the wrong button. The fallout from Sheridan, you know, basically, attacking his own people. I don't I don't like that in, in my top ten, because I don't like that episode, it gets on my nerves. Nice to see Carolyn Seymour, who's been in loads of Star Trek. She plays a uh, a senator, uh, obviously a goody one, because she's going, she's on the way to arrest President Clark with soldiers and stuff like that, but he takes his own life. So, anyway, and the next episode is the, the fallout of uh, um, Sheridan's actions, uh, and he's, he's forced to resign. I don't like the Earth Alliance, new Earth Alliance president, she's this Russian woman, and I don't like the actress, I don't think she's very good, but anyway. But that's in the, the next episode. But uh, Endgame is a, a cool episode with lots of action and space battles and stuff like that. And we see what happens with President Clark. Obviously, he was a baddie. And uh, it's all cool and good. And I really like it. And it's space battles. And I keep saying that. That's all I care about. Who gives a monkeys about story and characters? <laughs> Explosions. That's what we want. So, to number three in my top. 10 favourite episodes of Babylon 5 uh, from uh, season 2 it's the, the climax episode finale episode of season 2 uh, The Fall of Night um, where uh, things you know things are heating up um, the shadows have uh, made their presence known um, Centauri's Centauri Prime has invaded the Nan well declared War, open war is going on between Centauri and the Nan regime, Centauri Republic and the Nan regime. Um, and uh, things are happening on Earth. We learnt this where Night Watch is digging its heels in now, it's getting in there. And the Ministry of Peace, you know, it's very 1984. Oh, so where we're also learning from the Drazi and the Pakmara that the Centauri have started invading outlying systems on their, you know, territories. So the war is expanding. Um, so there's Sheridan playing pop with uh, uh, Malari, I think, probably. Yes, he is. Saying, you know, stop it. You're bringing all the other races in. And he's like, you know, well, it's 
what we're doing now. Have I been talking away with that no picture? But never mind. Roy de Trees arrives. Um, whatever. Uh, Roy de Trees arrives from the Ministry of Peace. Uh, that's not that's the, that's the actor's name. I forgot the name of the character. Um, and they think he's going to you know help mediate some peace between Centauri and Nan. But he's not. He's just there to say that uh, Earth has signed a non-aggression pact with the Centauri and that we're essentially allied with the Centauri. So, but then, uh, as luck would have it, well, bad luck, uh, a, no, a Nan warship jumps out of hyperspace asking for asylum at Babylon 5, and he agrees. Um, so that uh, puts a, a spanner in the works um, for Earth. But, um, all right, also, um, Lieutenant Keffer... Um, who were just were just in this one season. Um, uh, earlier on in the season, he'd seen a, a shadow ship in hyperspace, and he wants to go and find it again. So that's what he's going to do. And he dies at the end of this episode. Anyway, so they've got to protect this uh, this Nan warship. Um, uh, they've got to protect it because a Centauri warship arrives, and um, so he says, "You know, I'm going to protect that ship." Um, so that's what they're going to do. Hang on. So, and the the Centauri ship gets destroyed. More space battles, explosions. Um, oh, ah, yes, that's the famous shot of the uh, cargo stabilizer getting destroyed. But uh, that's the Centauri warship. Uh, it gets destroyed, blows up, loss of all hands, and the Nan warship gets away to a safe place. He's not happy. Uh, so he's got to apologise. He orders Sheridan to apologise to the Centauri. But, uh, you know, he's going to, I think he's going to say, he's not going to apologise. I'm sorry I didn't do it sooner and stuff like that. But on his way to the place where they're going to have this uh, apology uh, ritual, I suppose you could say, um, he's got to go, hang on, where are we? He's got to go on this uh, this transport. Um, I don't know, I don't think we saw this very often in Babylon 5. But, well, you know, cool. This transport that's high above. Uh, it's in the you know interior of the rotating section, uh, but one of the this Centauri fella there is left a bomb, and it blows up, and he jumps out. I don't know why he jumps out. <laughs> he just he just leaps out of the. Um, oh, I'll tell you if it shows it. There you go. He just leaps out of the um, the, the tram car, whatever. Just as it explodes, but because he's. Because it's a low gravity area, because it's in the centre of the rotating section, it's like falling quite slowly. But obviously, the closer he gets to the rotating part, he'll speed up and he'll splatter and eat the ground. So they think, what they're going to do? And there's like, got they've got emergency jetpacks. That's what she's calling for. Emergency jetpacks. We've got to save him, but they won't get there in time. So Delen says, "Kosh, you've got to help him." And Kosh comes out. He shows himself because nobody knows what a Vorlon looks like so he comes out he's going to show it there he is and all the different races see him as as them so the the Minbari see him as a Minbari um, the Drazi see him like that um, others see him as some but um, a human seem he looks you know like a human angel or whatever it looks basically looks like an angel from whatever species you are but Londo Malari's looking, and he doesn't look like a centaur. He doesn't see anything. I don't know if he, I don't know if he just can't see the ball, on if he's just wondering what they're all looking at, or if it's just just a, a, a ball of light. I don't know. But there you go. That's it. He can't see. He can't see anything, and he says this or nothing. Anyway, so there we go. That's what he looks like to Sheridan. So anyway, glides down, and um, so there we go. So now the shadows will know that the Vorlons have. Showed themselves anyway, so it's all a cool ending, a cool ending, and it's uh, one step closer to uh, Babylon 5 seceding from Earth and being at, at odds with the um, um, with the Earth Alliance. But uh, anyway, oh, and there we go. Keffer got his got his video of a shadow ship just before it destroyed him. Uh, he launched his, you know communications pod or something just as it blew him up so to get the first good look at a shadow vessel it's like a big spider so anyway it's a cool episode cool episode advancing the uh, the plot of the thing the fall of night cool stuff 
Right, we're at number two in my list, my top ten favourite episodes of Babylon 5, and we're all the way back to the beginning. Not the gathering, you know, the, the, the pilot movie, which I'm not a big fan of, to be completely honest. And Delenn looked awful in that. But anyway, thank God they changed it for this proper series. Uh, no, the very first episode of Babylon 5, Midnight on the Firing Line. Uh, I really, really like this episode. It's one of my favourite it's all like pilot episodes or opening episodes of uh, like any science fiction series because it just sets everything up, puts everything in place um, uh, for what's going to come forward-ish. Uh, um, but it kind of subverts it as well because uh, in season one of Babylon 5, it was kind of alluded to that the, the Centauri were kind of the goodies and the Nan were the baddies. Um, that's what it was like. The Nan were the aggressive people uh, the aggressive race, um, who, although, you know, not going around fighting people all the time, but th- they'd sell weapons to, to anybody that had the credits. Uh, they helped Earth during the earth Minbari War. Um, you know, sold as weapons and stuff like that. Uh, and this a similar thing happens in this episode, um, Midnight on the Firing Line. So, here we go. The, the Nan attack... A Centauri agricultural colony, which for some reason has got loads of mines around it. So, but anyway, um, there it is. Uh, so anyway, yeah, uh, here we go. So uh, Nan cruisers arrive, and uh, they basically, you know, they, they conquer the colony. Uh, they say it was it was a planet that was seized by the Centauri because Nan had been. Um, uh, invaded by the Centauri like a hundred years earlier or something like that, um, and like in the last few years they'd left. They st- essentially strip mined the planet, so it was no use to the Centauri anymore. And they left, leaving the Nan um, to their own devices, and they'd risen up at the Nan. They'd become quite a powerful, you know, a powerful race amongst the you know the League of Non-Aligned Worlds. Um, but then from season two, it switches and the Centauri become the bad guys and the Nan become the good guys and really important people, uh, particularly Jacquard, um, the, it's an, uh, the Nan ambassador on uh, Babylon 5. Uh, he has a, an amazing story arc and character arc, does uh, Jacquard, and he's probably the best character of all characters on Babylon 5. Everybody loves Jacquard because he was played amazingly by the late, great Andreas Katsoulis. Mm. Right, so we get, but it, the dialogue is is kind of clunky in this first episode because we're being introduced to characters. So it's where we first meet Susan Ivanova. She wasn't in the the pilot ep- episode, um, the gathering. Um, so we get things. Oh, you're new here, stuff like that. We're getting dialogue like that from Gary Baldy and, and all that stuff. But uh, it is it is cool. Uh, we meet uh, Jeffrey Sinclair and. Um, uh, oh, we're introduced to uh, Talia Winters, who's the telepath. Uh, we learn all about Psychor and what Psychor's done on Earth with people. Because apparently, a hundred years earlier, just telepaths had appeared on Earth. Um, uh, prop- the measurable telepaths, you know, it wasn't just a, a fringe thing anymore, uh, a supernatural thing. It, it became, you know, a scientifically measurable thing that humans had telepaths. And apparently, what to do with the Volons or that. Volunt had tinkered with us. Anyway, so this Nan invasion of uh, Ragesh 3 causes problems. Um, and it turns out there's also a problem with raiders. Raiders have been attacking ships. And we learn that the Nan have been um, uh, supplying the raiders um, with their weapons as well. So, uh, Commander Sinclair, there's um, Jakar. Uh, when he was a baddie. <laughs> but then he ended up being a goodie. By the end, um, so the the t- sort out the raiders, they um, sort out the uh, the nan, and you know I find the I don't think nan the nans leave Ragesh three, but th- they allow the colonists the Centauri colonists to leave, um, so that you know they have to back down a bit. Um, so there we go. But it's all setting up stuff that's to come. So you know the psycho. Um, Nan versus Centauri, which you know, properly expands uh, later on when the Centauri invade Nan again, and um, and all that stuff. And I think maybe we get a hint that there's other things going on. 
Um, they don't mention the shadows or all like that, but I think you know we, we kind of, it's kind of alluded to that there are forces out there um, and all that stuff. Um, yeah, it's a cool episode. I really like it. it's my favourite um, like, um, ta- uh, opening episode of any series, even even the Star Treks. You know, some episodes I love. Uh, that caretaker and you know the emissary like from Deep Space Nine and Voyager, um, which I really love. But from, I really like this one. But uh, anyway, so there we go. So that's uh, my number two, uh, Midnight on the Firing Line, the very first episode of Babylon Five, not counting the Gathering, um, because I don't, because I don't like that. <laughs> I don't. But anyway, <sighs> so we reached the number one. Uh, in my top ten episodes, favourite episodes of Babylon 5. Probably know what it's going to be. I think it's in a lot of people's favourite episodes. Um, I think it's won loads of awards. Uh, it's from season two. It's episode nine. It's The Coming of Shadows. I've even got the book. Uh, oh, probably with the dust. Uh, we've even got the book, The Coming of Shadows, which is you know the, essentially the script. Uh, the, you know, it's in script format. Screenplay format, uh, but with some... Uh, um, expositionary <laughs> text, but uh, there we go. Cool book by J. Michael Straczynski. There we go. The Coming of Shadows. Um, yeah, uh, this is the one where you know the shadows make themselves known. Um, an amazing episode. Like I say won a hatful of awards. Um, to where we meet. This is the Centauri Emperor, played by Turhan Bay, and the wood. Actually, called he was not named in this. It's just called Centauri Emperor. Um, but I think in in future, when he's mentioned later on, he's called Emperor Turhan. So they actually call him his, his name. Um, well, I think we're in the old Mummy films, Universal Mummy films. I think yes, the Mummy's Tomb. Yes, I knew I'd seen him in one of the Mummy films. Um, I think he played a baddie in that. I think uh, the Mummy's Tomb from 1942, back in the day. Anyway, in this, he's playing the Centauri Emperor. Uh, and he's basically he's going to Babylon Five, and he's going to apologise uh, to the to the Nan for um, uh, for what the what the Centauri did, uh, like an official apology. Um, but meanwhile, others in the Centauri government are basically plotting war and stuff like that. You've got Lord Reef uh, and Londo Malari, who's kind of is being pulled along uh, by events. And because of his uh, association with Mr. Morden, um, he can get things done. You know, the shadows will come and do and um, and um, destroy things that you know that uh, he wants doing. So, and this is where we first meet the Rangers as well. This fella comes onto the station. He's a ranger. He's got information um, for Gary Baldy uh, from um, uh, Sinclair. Um, so that, you know they're they're looking out for the shadows, so they know what's going on. Uh, that's Gary Baldy um, encountering this uh, this ranger. Um, what's happening here? Here we go. The shadows are arriving at um, um, the quadrant fourteen. They like the number fourteen for some reason. I think it's quadrant fourteen. Um, we've got that sector fourteen where Babylon Four disappeared. This is a nan colony thing in quadrant 14 whatever um the the um as as the emperor's speaking of peace on babylon 5 malari and lord reefer and all them uh are basically having the shadows they don't know it's the shadows you know they don't know but um they're having their their resources um destroying this nan um colony like Two hundred and a quarter of a million or something like that. Uh, now I'm there, so that happens. Um, but he doesn't know yet, does Jakar? And he's he's gone he's gone to buy. He thinks peace is at hand. Uh, so he's gone to buy um, malaria drink. Obviously, malaria knows what's going on. So, but then later on, he finds out what's um, uh, what the score is, and he's gonna go and kill malaria. And this is where they stop him. They say, stop it. You know, go back. We'll deal with this. Um, uh, but the the Centauri Emperor has a heart attack because um, Jakar we're going to go and assassinate him. But he has a heart attack first, and, um, and then Lord Reefer comes and says, 
Great news! Great news! They all speak like that because they're kind of like vampires <laughs> for some reason. They kind of even have little vampire fangs of the centauri. Um, we have destroyed the Narn colony in Quadrant 14. It is a great day. And he's like being what in peace and stuff. And he says, You're all damned. And then he dies. Uh, but Lord Reef is fine with it. Um, and, th and then basically. The upshot is the the war escalates. Um, the Centauri, um, um, you know, start invading other other parts of the you know the League of Non-Aligned Worlds and all stuff like that. It's basically, the world, the galaxy is going to hell in a handbasket, and all that stuff. So, yeah, it's a, a cool episode, and it won buckets of awards. Um, so, yeah. Um, Proper, proper good stuff. Um, Lord Reefer is is kind of he's, he is Malari's friend until they're not friends anymore. Because it's all about ambition, and um, he's very ambitious. He's got plans to be emperor one day, but um, he makes a mistake. Or <sighs> Malari thinks that Lord Reefer uh, killed a, a woman he loved. And uh, so he has Lord Reefer killed. I think he has Nan, uh, these Nan people. Basically, tear him apart. It doesn't show it, obviously, but the, that's what happens to him. And uh, But it turns out it wasn't him that had the woman he, he loved uh, killed. It was Mr. Morden, obviously. Uh, but anyway, that's by the by. So there we go. So that's um, the coming of shadows. Um, and they do. They do. Uh, arrive oh there we go here come the shadows look cool ships anyway so there we go so that's uh, the coming of shadows uh, a great episode right so uh, i said that um um i would uh, like it's like an honorable mention but it's not an episode of the series um it's actually the the first tv movie that were released and um my opinion the best uh, and I wish they'd do a remastered version of this. Maybe there is one, I don't know, but I've not come across it. Um, I've got it on... Um, I've got it on VHS or DVD, I can't remember. <laughs> got it on something. It's Babylon 5 in the beginning. Well, it's behind me, head. you can just see it there. Um, the first movie, if, if you don't count The Gathering, which I don't, cause as I've said before, I'm not a fan of that. I mean, I'm a massive fan of this. If only they'd redo it with like updated CG, but anyway, um, it basically tells the story of the Earth, this beginning of the Earth Minbari War, and it's amazing. Even though it does mess with canon a little bit, you know, stuff that had been set up in the series, it kind of switches them a bit. But um, it is a, a cool, a cool little movie that goes on for about an hour and a half, and it begins in the future uh, where we've seen old Malari, who's Emperor Malari of Centauri. Centauri Prime's been devastated because of what happened during the Shadow War and stuff like that. And the, the allies of the Shadows are still around. Um, but uh, it's telling these kids a story about what happened with the Earth Minbari War and what he had to do with it. Because uh, he was connected with it, was well, well, Londo, in a little bit of a way. Um, so basically, we're going back. It's uh, the Earth had. had um, even though it's one of the the younger spacefaring races, it did have quite a uh, an impact on the the local space, so to speak, um, because they dealt with the Dilgar. I think Dilgar were a race that invaded or started invading um, other planets, and Earth kind of stepped in and uh, helped defeat them. Um, and so it got a bigger sphere of influence, and it kind of made Earth a little bit cocky. Um, and they'd heard about them in Bari, but they'd never, never encountered them. So they ask, um, um, they ask uh, young, younger Londo Malari uh, about them in Bari. Um, so you know, they want to open channels between them. So they're going to send an expedition to Mimbari space. And Malari saying, "You shouldn't really do that. Uh, you know, you leave them alone. Um, if they want to talk to you, they'll come and talk to you. But otherwise, don't you know, don't bother them." Uh, but uh, obviously, said Earth Alliance, it's got cocky, and they said, um, 
we we dealt with the we, we handled the Dilga, we can handle you know the Mimbari, and he says oh, you know, arrogance and stupidity <laughs> in one package. He says okay, I warned you, but whatever. The, I think the, he gives them the information about you know what they need, about where to go. So they're going to send a, an expedition, and um, he won't help. But uh, we we learn that. Um, Z- Jakar's there, and he'll he, he'll you know help him as well, you know for the right price. Uh, meanwhile, this fella, uh, I mean, Bar, is like the precursor to the Rangers. He knows that the shadows are coming, the Great War is coming, um, and he's, 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 he wants to tell um, the the Mimbari leader Ducat, with no relation to Gul Ducat from Deep Space Nine. <laughs> anyway, so uh, you know going to tell him so that uh, he fears that you know the shadows are coming back uh, and this is where we meet Delaine before she gets her hair um, she was one of Ducat's helpers she eventually rises to the the Grey Council and all that but uh, anyway uh, and they learn that there's a new race called humans uh, who are out there and they're going to he's going to take his ships uh, and they're going to contact these humans because they think they're going to be important because the Vorlons know that the humans are going to be important as well Anyway, uh, so we're, oh, that's Ducat. Um, we also meet Young, there he is, Young John Sheridan, who's Commander Sheridan in this. Um, and he's... Uh, um, he's gonna, he's, he wants to stay with the ship. He's offered a promotion um, to uh, become the first officer of one of the ships that's going to, uh, to Minbari space, but he, he doesn't like the captain. He says he's a hothead. And they shouldn't go. But they said, no, oh, the decision's made. So he stays with his captain and says, whatever, you know, it, it, giving up this plum assignment, but whatever. Anyway, this is the hothead captain. Um, he arrives, they arrive, and they, they encounter the, the Minbari ships. Uh, they've got, and it all goes wrong. <laughs> it all goes wrong. Uh, because the Minbari fleet opens, uh, approaches them with gun ports open, and in Minbari ways, that that's a a gesture of openness that they're not going to actually fire, but they're showing them how many weapons they have. But you know the weapon systems are not activated, and he doesn't know this. The hu- the humans don't know this, so they think they're going to attack. So they open fire first, um, kill Ducat. Ducat gets killed. Um, uh, they open fire and, um, and essentially just run away then. Uh, and this is what starts the Earth Minbari War, because Ducat is killed, their leader is killed, and the Minbari go mad, and they say, right, we're going to wipe out we're going to wipe out the humans. So that's it, it, it begins, just the war, and the conscription starts, and they're just flung, flinging bodies at the Minbari. And we can't beat them, because they're just too advanced, because they're one of the oldest space spacefaring races. And uh, the, way beyond our technology. So, um, oh, we meet a young Susan Ivanova before she joins Earth Force. Her brother, he goes out and he gets killed by the uh, the Mimbari. We also see what John Sheridan does. He's, he's the only person that managed to take out a Mimbari ship. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, but he's got to go on a mission uh, in a bit uh, when he takes out after he takes out the Mimbari ship uh, in a minute. Uh, his captain gets killed, that's what's happening there. His captain gets killed, so he takes command of the ship and um, he mines an asteroid field and takes out a Minbari warship, the Black Star, um, if I can find it. Um, so that's what he does. So you know, It's their first victory, humans' first victory. Maybe their only victory in the Minbari war uh, because uh, the humans are on the verge of you know, um, extinction. Um, but they're going to send John Sheridan and Dr. Um, what's his face? Um, oh, I can't remember his name now. <laughs> the doctor from Babylon 5. Him. Um, they send him to um, on on a mission to meet, you know, this Minbari who uh, knows about the shadows and stuff like that. And they take Jakar along with them. Uh, but it doesn't help because... Um, uh, somebody comes and, and opens fire on on the uh, on the the station that they're on uh, on the planet, and there we go. And you know, he gets killed and all that stuff. So that 
that's failed. They get oh, they get captured by the Mimbari, and um, there's Delenn there, and uh, where we learn that um, the humans. This is their first encounter with physically encounter with humans. They learn that humans and Minbari souls, Minbari souls have been reborn in humans. I don't know if that is actually the case, but that's what they believe. Um, but it's all to do with Sinclair going back in time a thousand years and becoming a Minbari. So obviously, there's some human blood. If he had, I presume he had kids, maybe he took a Minbari wife, I don't know. But. Um, to learn that but anyway we've got to get to the battle of the line because Midbari forces are just slaughtered in humans wherever they encounter them and they're just going to attack earth it's called the battle of the line and um here we go and um it's one the earth's last stand and you know we're on you know we're going to lose essentially we're going to lose uh but this is when they they discover that uh, the capture Jeffrey Sinclair, and um, it's where that they learn that uh, he's, he's got he's part Minbari or something like that, even though he's not <laughs> at this point. But uh, whatever, he's, he's, he has he's got the the DNA of Valen, hasn't he? So he, he he makes something glow. The I can't remember what they call it, but um, anyway, that's it. Humans are about to be annihilated, uh, but then they find out that uh, Minbari souls have been reborn in humans, and Minbari don't kill Minbari. Um, so they, they basically surrender. Um, even though they're about to win, the Minbari surrender. Earth wins the Earth-Minbari war by default. So they, they kind of even get, get a bit even cockier, but uh, never mind. And... Um, and there we go. And so that's that's how we learn what happened to them. They build the uh, uh, Babylon Five. And um, does it does it show? Uh, oh, and then it cuts to uh, a bit from War Without End. Um, oh, there we go. It shows them. They decide that it's not going to to stop a war happening like that again. They're going to build a station called Babylon, the Babylon Project. Uh, and they said uh, it. You know, it it didn't go well the first couple of times. There we see Babylon one, I think that's supposed to be, and it blows up. Was it Babylon two and three? I think they were sabotaged. Don't know the story behind that. I'm sure there is one. Babylon four disappeared, but uh, there we go. But uh, it is cool. I really like in the beginning. I really like in the beginning. Um, you know, it, it might even be my number one. <laughs> Probably would be to be completely honest. Um, if it were an actual episode of the series, that would be my number one, which is why I'm doing it last. Um, it is really, really good. I really enjoy it. And um, it shows how arrogant Earth people can be, um, even in the face you know, of evidence in front of them. But, uh, but it also shows how brave they can be, and they just never give up. They'll you know, never give up, never surrender, and all that stuff. Um, but we were lucky, <laughs> essentially. We're about to get made extinct, and then something happened, and uh, we end up saving the galaxy at the end. So there we go. So there we go. So that's my top ten um, uh, favorite Babylon Five episodes and the movie in the beginning, which would probably be my number one overall, to be completely honest. But there we go. So that's it. So I'll go through it. I'll go through it one last time. My top ten one last time. I'll go through it. So number ten, we had um, The Deconstruction of Falling Stars, episode 22 of season four. Then number nine, In the Shadow of Zahadoom, uh, from season two, episode 16. Uh, then number eight, War Without End, parts one and two, which were episodes 16 and 17 of season three. Then number seven, Babylon Squared, which was um, uh, episode 20 of season one. Uh, number six, Zahadoom, which was the finale episode from season three, episode 22. Uh, number five, Into the Fire, uh, season four, episode six, where we, the Shadow War is brought to a conclusion. Um, number four, End Game, from season four, episode 20, where the uh, Earth is saved from the um, tyranny of President Clark. Uh, number three, The Fall of Night, from season two, episode 22. Uh, where Sheridan learns all about Morden and his wife and stuff like that. What happened with the Icarus and uh, how important he is going to be 
in the future. Uh, number two, the very first episode, season one, episode one, Midnight on the Firing Line, where it sets it all up, puts all the chess pieces on the board, um, only for them to be all moved about in later seasons. And then number one, uh, season two, episode nine, The Coming of Shadows, where it does what it says on the tin. Uh, it won buckets of awards. Um, the Hope of Peace, destroyed by a few uh, ambitious men. Um, you know, And it's kind of tragic, but kind of exciting as well. Um, and then I had my honourable mention, um, my, my proper number one, I suppose you could say, is the, the movie in the beginning, which I think is really, 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 really good. There were other movies, there were Third Space, and... Um, um, what about a soul hunter? River of Souls, uh, and then the war, um, a call to arms, which were kind of like a prequel to Crusade. Uh, but they were okay, but they weren't as good as in the beginning. So there we go. So that's my list. That's my list of uh, my top ten favourite Babylon Five episodes. Right. So if you agree with me. Comment down below. If you don't, comment down below as well. But uh, before you go, don't forget to like and subscribe and share and comment, as I said, and explore the description for various links for stuff, for merch and uh, stuff like that, and my books and all that malarkey. Right, so we'll leave it there. So thanks for watching and listening to me waffle on about uh, Babylon 5. Uh, but wherever you are, look after each other. And until next time, I'll see the. Thank you.